Chapter 25 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 25 It was a hell of a long quarter mile back to the house. I had plenty of time to think and plenty of uncomfortable notions to think about. Jordan Reed hadn't been worried. I had promised him that I was on my way to the CCG with enough information to turn City Hall upside down and shake it like shaking dirty socks out of a laundry bag. And he hadn't been worried. I'd seen two possibilities for that. He'd made a deal with the CCG, or he'd managed to make a deal higher up and pull the reformer's sting. But not until right now did I see the third possibility. That I'd never get back to town. But there was the maid breaking into Reed's office, and the funny look the gardener had given me. This might be something else entirely. I had three men with me in the car. Bill was unarmed, and he was a non-combatant anyway. Art and Ben were armed, but whose side were they on? I'd let them flank me all afternoon, and what the hell did I know about them, or what the hell did I know about what Jack Bycho was planning? I was an idiot. I'd just about come to that decision when we reached the house again, and I break to a stop. Two of the police cars passed me, parked just ahead, and the third stopped against my rear bumper. I sat tense, both hands still holding the wheel high up, where I wouldn't have far to move to get inside my coat. I looked straight out the windshield and said, Stay in the car. Let them make all the first moves. Nobody answered me. Up ahead, the car doors were opening and spilling out Winston's finest. I heard the chatter of a police radio and wanted to switch on my own radio and listen in on the calls, but it seemed somehow like a bad time to do it. Ed Jason came strolling back toward me, paused by the fender, and looked in through the windshield at me and suddenly grinned. Take it easy, Tim, he said. We're not saying you did it. You're just all maybe witnesses, that's all. Did what? I asked him. Killed her, he said. Killed who? He shrugged. Don't know yet. You fellas just sit right in the car. Arkham will be along pretty soon. And he moseyed. There's just no other word for Ed Jason's walk off toward the house. Beside me, Art said, Yeah. I looked at him, and he was offering me a fresh-lit cigarette. I grinned spastically, letting all the tension out, and took the cigarette from him. I said, Thanks. Bill Casal in the back seat said, What's going on? You've got me, Billy boy, I told him. I felt very good, very expansive. It doesn't concern us. I said. That's all that matters to me. Art said, Shall we get our story straight? What stories? I asked him. We don't know anything. Did you guys see any woman getting killed? Art said, No. Bill said, I didn't see anybody except that old man when you were on the porch. Ben didn't say anything. Ben never said anything. Well then, I said, What were you all doing here? Art asked me. The truth, I said. He raised an eyebrow, but he let it go at that. We sat around watching, and after a while I figured it out that the main area of interest was around on the other side of the house. The chain of events seemed clear up to a point. The gardener had been over on that side of the house, had seen the dead woman, had rushed into the house and informed the maid, and she had come charging in to tell Reed just as I was leaving. Reed had quickly called the law while I was chatting with Allison and standing around on the front porch, and by the time I'd driven out to the highway... The law had arrived. It was clear, as I say, up to a point. Then it got muddy. For instance, who was this dead woman? Not Allison, obviously, since I had just talked with her. And not the maid, either. And I didn't know of any other women who lived in this house. And just incidentally, who had killed her? And why had it happened on the Reed estate? I stewed on those questions for maybe half an hour, and finally Harkham arrived. He conferred with Ed Jason for a while up on the front porch, and then... Ed moseyed on over and said to me, Hawkham wants a chat. All of us? He just mentioned you. So the others waited, and I went on up the porch to talk to Harkham. Ed Jason headed back around the corner of the house like a cowboy going to the corral. The porch was what you might call crowded. Harkham was there, and so was Jordan Reed, and so was Marvin Reed, and so was Allison Reed. Marvin looked baffled. Harkham looked angry. Jordan angrier and Allison angriest. Harkham said, when I was halfway through the screen door onto the porch, 
Hey, you bunch seen her at all? I shook my head. I didn't. I asked the others, and they didn't either. From the spot where she was killed, said Jordan Reed tightly, she walked in from the highway, took the dirt path shortcut through the trees. You wouldn't have seen her from the front of the house at all. We're trying to find out if anybody saw who she left the hotel with, said Harkham. Isn't that obvious? asked Jordan Reed bitterly. She left alone, probably took a cab and walked in from the highway because she didn't want anyone else to see her. He flashed a bitter glance at his son. I suppose she's been here before, he said, when I was away on business. Never, cried Marvin. He still looked baffled, but now he looked a bit scared as well. I suppose, said Jordan, neither of you expected me back from Albany so early. I didn't even know she was in town, cried Marvin hopelessly. I haven't seen her for years. You wanted to know why I didn't give you a grandson, said Allison, her voice harsh and vicious. Now you know why. I don't have to hide it any more. Allison, cried Marvin, like a drowning man calling for a life preserver he doesn't really expect to get. I knew Sherry used to know Marv, started Harkham, and I inadvertently interrupted him, blurting, Sherry? He glanced over at me, somber and frowning. Yeah, Sherry, he said. Oh ho, I thought. Oh ho de ho ho. The dead woman was Sherry, who used to know Marvin Reed and who had come to town with Harkham. I could see why Harkham was so gloomy. It isn't pleasant to realize you were just a railroad ticket. Sherry had come to town to see Marvin again, and if I had figured Sherry right, she spelled Marvin with a capital dollar sign. Had she seen him? The cluck in question was saying, Dad, I haven't seen her for years. I, I swear it. Not for years. Jordan looked at his son the way he had looked at a new dealer and said, You're a scum. And then he looked away again. Never had a son been disinherited so briefly or so completely. Harkham caught that message, too, and took courage from it. To Marvin, he said, It looks like you're a prime suspect, boy, and the only suspect. But I didn't see her, Marvin wailed. I swear, I swear it, I never even saw her. What was the weapon? I asked. Harkham pointed at the whitewashed porch table. There was something on it wrapped in a white handkerchief. I went over to inspect. Harkham was so used to me nosing around he didn't make a murmur. It was a bone-handled hunting knife, balanced with a thick blade six inches long. Sheldon's, the big department store downtown, sold that particular model by the carload lot. Winston is a big hunting town, and this was one of the most popular hunting knives. What about Prince? I asked. Harkham snorted. On that handle? He was right, come to think of it. A rough, grainy surface like the handle of that knife wouldn't produce a print in a million years. Harkham was saying, You want to tell us about it, Muff? She came up here to talk to you. She wanted money, I guess. You couldn't afford what she wanted, and you were afraid your father would see her. So you killed her, and you were going to get rid of the body, but the gardener came along first, scaring you off. Is that the way it happened? Marvin just stared at Harkham, shaking his head slightly, and then he turned to his father, who was glaring out over the wooded slope at the town. Dad, he said. Dad, please. Jordan didn't move. Dad, please, said Marvin. I didn't do it. I haven't seen her for years. I, Dad, listen to me. I'd do anything for you. You know that. I haven't seen her for years. He stopped, his hands working jerkily in his lap. He looked pleadingly at me, at Harkham, even at Allison. Anything, he said. I, I didn't do it. It was uncomfortable as hell for everybody concerned, and we were all grateful for the interruption when the silence following Marvin's plea was broken by the screen door opening. It was Art, looking in with polite apology, saying, You okay, Mr. Smith? I'm peachy, I told him. He took that at face value and said to the group in general, Is it all right if I use the phone? Jordan turned away from glaring at the town to glare at Art, a who-the-hell-are-you glare, and then he shrugged. Go ahead. Thanks. Art came in the rest of the way and said to me in a somewhat lower voice, Got to check in with Jack again. He went on into the house, and Harkham cleared his throat portentously. It seems like a pretty clear case to me, Marv, he said. You sure you don't want to talk about it? Before Marvin could answer, I got to my feet and said to Harkham, Can I talk to you for a second? He frowned at me. What the hell is it, Tim? Just take a second, I said. 
Grumbling, he followed me along the porch and around the corner, out of sight and hearing of the family group back there. I said, Let me do you a favor, Harkham. Jordan just might reconsider. You better take it easy with Martin. It's an open and shut case, Tim, he said. I shook my head. It's an obvious case, I told him. But it isn't open and shut. You don't have any witnesses. You'll never trace that knife back to Marvin in a million years, and you don't know for sure that she even got to Marvin. I got a good circumstantial case, he started. You don't have any case at all, I told him. A good defense lawyer will run your case right out of court, and if Jordan reconsiders, Marvin will have a good defense lawyer. Then what the hell am I supposed to do, he demanded. Take it easy, I advised him, and let your detectives handle this. That's what the city pays them for. You've already made one stupid arrest. You mean Lascaux? I've got a case against him, by God. And the hell you do, too. I've got a case, he insisted. I'd sure like to see it, I said. You'll see it, he said darkly. You might like to know what Lascaux's job is in the National Guard. I blinked. I knew Ron was a lieutenant in the Guard. It kept him from active duty. But I didn't see what the hell that had to do with the price of beans. I give up, I said. What is his job with the National Guard? He's in charge of a bomb demolition squad, he said. They taught him all about taking bombs apart and putting them back together again. I stared at him. Is that all you got? Not by a long shot. He pushed past me, the conversation finished for now, and went back to the reeds where he started telling Marvin how he shouldn't leave town or anything, that although he wasn't under arrest, he would probably be wanted for questioning and he should keep himself available and... I broke in, saying, You want me to stick around here anymore? He looked at me, thrown off the track. Hell no, he said, and went back to Marvin, trying to remember where he had left off. Keep yourself available, I prompted collected my dirty look, and went back to the car. Art hadn't returned yet, so I sat there and answered Bill's questions for a while. Then Art came strolling toward the car, frowning, his usual sardonic smile missing from his face. He slid into the front seat beside me and said, There have been some changes, Mr. Smith. Such as? Jack says for me and Ben to come on back in. Why? He shrugged. It looks like the arrangement between you and him is all finished meaning that our own private arrangement was still alive. He wants you right away? Right away, he said. I wondered if this move had anything to do with Reed's earlier smugness. I had the feeling in the small of my back that it did. Just in case he changes his mind again, said Art casually, why do we get in touch with you? I wasn't sure myself. I still didn't have a working phone at home, and I'd be pretty much on the move from now on. I finally decided on Kathy's place, figuring she could take a message if I wasn't there. He took down the address and number and said, Mind dropping us off in town? Not at all. This time we got to the highway with no interference, and I went a couple blocks out of the way to drop Art and Ben off in front of the People's Candy Store. Bill switched to the front seat, and we drove on down toward the center of town. End of chapter 25《Chapter 26 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 26 I'm worried, Tim, said Ron Laskow. At first I thought Harkham was crazy. He'd never make the charge stick, but now I'm not so sure. We were sitting in the visitor's room in the Winston City Jail a buggy-whip-era clink that took up half the basement of City Hall. There was none of the wire mesh separating me from Ron that they have in the big city jails and the state and federal penitentiaries. The visitor's room was simply a bare square room with cream-colored walls and four of the old wooden chairs that used to be upstairs in City Court. The door to the cell area was open. The other door was closed and locked, but it was simply a wooden door with an ordinary Yale lock on it. All four chairs were occupied at the moment. There was Ron and Bill Casal and a cop named Titus O'Hearn and me. Why aren't you sure? I asked him. There isn't a bit of evidence against you. Well, there's that tax scheme thing, he said. So what? I already knew about that. You knew you were safe from me and you had no reason to want to kill me. He nodded and rubbed a hand wearily over his face. He was wearing brown slacks and a white shirt open at the collar, the sleeves rolled up. 
Just the fact of being in jail, innocent or not, had taken a lot of starch out of him. I don't have any alibi for the time when the grenade was thrown, he said. I was at home alone. So were a lot of people, I told him. So was I, for that matter. And I know about the National Guard thing, the bomb demolition squad. That maybe gives you the method for the bomb in the car, but not for the hand grenade. His grin was sick. <laughs> sure it does, he said. How so? The guard isn't as tight as the regular army, he said. I mean, the controls aren't as good, and you've got a bunch of young kids in there. Every summer during the two weeks at camp, something disappears from the armory. A gun, or a grenade, or maybe just a holster. But always something. So if the whole damn guard is short one hand grenade, I said, they'll try to pin it on you? They've got it all, Tim, he said. Not enough to convince you, maybe, because you know me and you're on my side. But whose side is the judge going to be on? And they've got it all. Motive and method and opportunity. What about the other tries? I demanded. What about the Tarker killing? Or the shots fired at me from City Hall? He shook his head. I won't be charged with trying to kill you, he said. He nodded at Bill. I'll be charged with killing his grandfather. While trying to kill me, I insisted. Sure, he said, and if the defense even does succeed in getting the other tries admitted, what good does that do me? I've been to New York in the last three months, so I could have hired that gunman. And I was home alone when he was killed, too. And when you were being shot at from City Hall, I was driving out to Hillview, alone. He has less of a case against you than he does against Marvin Reed, I said. He looked blank. Marvin Reed? I told him about the killing of Sherry, and he said, Jesus, it's catching. Who would have thought little Marvy had the guts? Maybe he didn't do it, I said. Sure, and maybe pigs fly. He got to his feet, paced nervously back and forth in the small room, his arms swinging with nervous tension at his sides. He ought to be in here, he said. Not me, for Christ's sake. Who's your lawyer? I asked him. Stanley Crawford? I nodded. Crawford was an old man in semi-retirement now who had first encouraged Ron to study law. He was able, but slow-moving, having long since adapted himself to the snail's pace of the law. "'What's he doing about getting you out of here?' I asked. "'Oh, he's trying to get Judge Lowry to set bail. I don't know. He said he'd come down and see me this evening.' "'I don't like to rush you fellers,' said Titus O'Hearn, the guard." But I would like to get this felon here back behind bars so I could go get me some chow. Titus was a short, grizzled, toothless old duffer, given duty here in the town clink when he got too old to walk a beat anymore. I looked at him. You alone here? Damn right, he said. For how long? He grimaced. Forever, from the looks of things, he said. I should have been off duty at five o'clock, dang near an hour ago. Then why aren't you? Young Ed Veitcher was supposed to take over from me, he explained, but he walked off with the rest of the family. I came to attention, hearing the clang of a warning bell. They walked off? He nodded sourly. The whole dang family, he said. Just a little before four. They all just up and walked off without a buy your leave to anybody. What's happening out there, Tim? Ron asked me. I looked at him and shook my head. I don't know. A war, I think. And I'm no longer sure who's on what team. If Jack Veitcha marches his people after Jordan Reed and the others? He left the sentence unfinished. I finished it for him. If he does, I said, he'll solve every one of our problems for us. Maybe Jordan's out of it anyway, he said, now that his son is in trouble. I doubt it. When I was up there, Jordan washed his hands of the whole thing. He's been ignoring Marvin's little flaws for years, so now he's swung just as far to the other extreme. I'm mighty hungry, said Titus O'Hearn. I got to my feet. Right you are, I said. To Ron, I said, I'll be over at Kathy's place for a while. If Crawford manages to get you out tonight, come on over. I will, he said. End of chapter 26《Chapter Twenty Seven of Killing Time by Donald Westlake》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker.
Chapter 27 Bill and Kathy and I made a glum, silent trio for dinner. Bill was glum and silent because that was his natural state. Kathy was glum and silent because she was still somewhat mad at me on general principles. And I was glum and silent because I had a hell of a lot to think about, and very little of it was cheery. Item. Jordan Reed wasn't worried about me going to the CCG. Item. Ron Laskow was in jail on a trumped-up charge that just might get a conviction if the political climate was right. Item. Jack Vicha had cancelled his deal with me and called in his whole family, and a lot of them, being duly sworn in cops, possessed guns. Item. Paul Mazzetti, who seemed to be as honest as he was unpleasant, had been pulled out of town by the CCG. Item. The guy who had been shooting at me was still running around loose. A dandy series of items. Dinner lay like wet cotton in my stomach, and cigarettes tasted like cardboard. Hal Gans called during dessert, saying he had been looking all over town for me and asking if he could come over. He sounded about as excited and worried as phlegmatic Hal possibly could, so I told him, sure, come on over. He arrived at 6.30 and breathlessly delivered his news. All the Northside people on the force have left. All the Vitches. Trust Hal to be second to bring the news. I know, I said. They're police, he said. He couldn't understand it. They're vitches, I answered. We were all together in the living room, Bill Casal quiet in his corner, Kathy and I on the sofa, Hal sitting tense on the edge of an armchair. Kathy now reached over and touched my arm, saying, How much can you rely on the CCG, Tim? I'm not sure anymore, I admitted. At first I thought they were honest. That's the way Mazzetti looked anyway. But he's gone, said Hal, discovering another piece of news to deliver second. He uh, left this afternoon. There's a new man coming in this evening, I said. Why? He asked baffled again. Why should they switch their men around like that? I don't know, I said, but I'd sure like to find out. How can you? Kathy asked me. This is something, I said, reaching for the phone that I should have done long ago. And I placed a long-distance call to New York, person to person, to Terry Samuelson, the guy who had written the letter of introduction Mazzetti had given me. When he came on the line at last, I identified myself and answered two or three questions about how things were going in little old Winston, and then I said, This guy Paul Mazzetti got in touch with me yesterday, Terry. Oh, yeah, he said. The letter of recommendation. I was wondering just how much of a guarantee that letter was, I said. You weren't pressured into writing it or anything, were you? Hell no, he said. I've known Paul for seven, eight years. He's as honest as they come. I'd recommend him to anybody for anything. What about the organization he's with? What do you know about them? The Citizens for a Clean Government? Only what Paul told me. And what did he tell you? He said they weren't perfect, but they gave him pretty much of a free reign, and it was possible to get a lot of good work done with them. But they weren't perfect, I said. I got the impression, he said carefully, that he didn't care for the way the outfit had handled things once or twice, didn't care for a couple of the people connected with it, but it didn't matter to him what the rest of them were like, so long as they let him do things the way he wanted. So you don't know that the whole organization is honest. There was silence on the line for a long second, and then he said in a small voice, Have I goofed, Tim? I'm not sure, I told him. Maybe we all have. I'll call you in a day or two. Tim, if I've thrown you a curve, I'm sorry, boy. You know why? Sure, Terry, I know. I'll call you in a day or two. I hung up and looked at the three faces watching me. Mazzetti he'll vouch for, I said. The CCG he can't vouch for. And Mazzetti, said Kathy softly, is gone. In maybe ten minutes, I said, getting to my feet, I'll find out where the CCG stands in all this. Should I come along, said Bill. No, you wait here. I'll be back as soon as I can. End of chapter 27《Chapter 28 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 28 Daniil had already arrived at the hotel. 
I got his room number from Charlie, the desk man, and told him to never mind announcing me. I'd announce myself. Then I took the elevator up and knocked on his door. The door opened after a minute, and I came face to face with my second example of the Citizens for Clean Government. This one, Archer Daniel, turned out to be a huge, full-faced, red-haired, florid individual who looked upon all the world, it seemed, with the same high degree of impersonal contempt. His eyes were small and pale blue, set deep beneath shaggy red brows, and his mouth was a thin, wide line, permanently down-curved at the corners. The backs of his fingers were underbrushed with straggly red hairs, and the red hair motif was followed through in thick waves atop his head. His massive chest and stomach were covered by a broad expanse of white shirt, with a black tie draped precisely down the middle of all the whiteness. He wore a black suit, the jacket open, and on his red-haired left wrist was a watch with a gold band. Archer Daniel, I said. He nodded slowly and with dignity. I'm Tim Smith, I said. Mr. Mazzetti may have mentioned me. Licensed investigator, he said. It was a category, and I'd just been filed away in it, and that took care of me. I nodded and stuck out my hand to see what he'd do with it. He shook it. His handshake was too strong to be natural, and I got the idea this was a man who constantly tested his fellow beings for the degree to which they had failed to reach perfection, the yardstick being quite naturally himself. I felt somewhat more optimistic. Judging by Mazzetti, a prerequisite for an honest, unbribable reformer was a miserable personality. Daniil seemed to have that qualification to excess. He frowned, puckering his lips out the way Sidney Greenstreet used to. And when he said, come in, I knew it was only after a long interior struggle. He turned away into the room, leaving me to close the door after myself. I did so and went down the two-pace long hall to the living room of the suite. Daniil, ahead of me, settled down upon the sofa with the weighty dignity of Henry VIII at a rural court of high justice, and motioned with one hand for me to take the armchair to his right. I did so, and he said, "'Quite frankly, Mr. Uh, Smith, I am not as yet fully apprised of the situation here in Winston. I haven't yet read Mr. Mazzetti's report, and so I honestly don't know just what the current status is in this city, nor where you stand within it.' Mazzetti asked me to cooperate with the CCG, I said. I turned him down, thinking my loyalty was more to the people in the town than to outsiders. He nodded heavily. An attitude, unfortunately, that we quite often have to contend with. But there have been a number of changes since then, I went on. Two people have been murdered in attempts to kill me. I no longer have any feeling of loyalty to stop me. And now do you wish to cooperate with us? Is that it? That's it. He pursed his lips again, thinking, his eyes gazing off into the middle distance. At last he said, And of what would this cooperation consist, Mr. Smith? Information, I told him. Kickbacks, nepotism, fake construction bids, mismanagement of municipal funds. I see. He rested his hands in his lap and tapped the tips of his fingers together. He studied the effect for a while and then said, You have learned of all these things in the time since Mr. Mazzetti talked to you? No, I have comprehensive files for the last fifteen years. Files, he looked at me. You mean you have known of these things for fifteen years? I've kept complete files, I said. Have you ever before this attempted to get this information into the hands of the proper authorities? I shook my head. That wasn't my job. My job was not your job. He sounded honestly shocked. Surely, Mr. Smith, it is every citizen's job. No, I said. For all his individual personality and appearance, completely unlike Mazzetti, he wound up spouting the same tired civics class garbage. My job, I told him, was to be a confidential investigator. If the facts I learn wind up in court, I'm not useful. He shook his head slowly back and forth, the lips once more pursed. I don't know, Mr. Smith, he said. I have no idea what sort of arrangement Mr. Mazzetti had in mind, or what offers he made you, if any. But I'm afraid I'll have to know quite a bit more about the situation here in Winston before agreeing to do business with you. 
If you are attempting now to gain immunity for yourself by making some sort of deal with the citi- Immunity? What the hell kind of immunity? Now, really, Mr. Smith, he said ponderously, after all you've just stated to me that you have in your possession a record of governmental crimes in this community covering the last 15 years, and that you have until this very moment never once attempted to reveal this information to the proper authorities. Quite the reverse. You have gone so far as to admit to me that you have actively concealed the evidence of these crimes. Never. This interview wasn't going at all as I had expected, and I was beginning to lose my temper. I have never, I told him angrily, concealed the evidence of any crime. The evidence has always been there and is there now, and any proper authority who's interested can go find it exactly the way I did by looking for it. It isn't my job to do the proper authority's work for it. Your job as you describe it, Mr. Smith, he said pompously, is a dishonest one. As a matter of fact, I went on talking over him, what lousy proper authorities anyway? The district attorney? He's one of the biggest crooks in the state. The mayor? The chief of police? That isn't the point, he said. Why the hell isn't it? I live in Winston, in the real world. I have to make my living in Winston, in the real world. And that means I have to make my peace with the people who run Winston and who run the real world. I tried that, and it's always worked pretty well. Now you people have come in and rattled this town out of its wits, and that arrangement doesn't work anymore. I'm adapting myself to the new conditions, that's all. I'm no more honest or dishonest in the vague, abstract, total way you use those terms than anybody else alive in the world. I have a job, an honest and proper job, licensed by the state of New York and the city of Winston, and I do that job as well as I can. And a part of that job is its confidential nature. My job is confidential in exactly the same way that a lawyer's job or a doctor's job or a psychiatrist's job or even a priest's job is confidential. Is a lawyer supposed to report every crime he hears described in his office? Is a priest supposed to report every crime he hears described in the confessional? This is not the same thing, Mr. Smith. And from the shocked, wide-eyed way in which he said that, I knew I had blasphemed. And just why the hell isn't it the same thing? I shouted. I was on my feet now without knowing how or why I'd stood up, and I kept shaking my fist as I shouted at him. I've been responsible for crimes solved, reparations made, injustices corrected, without the people involved getting into a lot of bad publicity, and without anyone getting a useless jail sentence. And I've... Useless? That one brought Daniil to his feet, too. Blasphemy against the penal system was apparently even worse than blasphemy against the church. Yes, you're goddamn right, useless. Look, you take a kid... I had to stop and shake my head and take a deep breath and start all over again so the words would come out slow enough to be pronounced. You take a kid, I said. He burgles a grocery store. The law gets him, and the court gives him six months in a reformatory. And he comes out a worse kid than when he went in. And ten years and four penitentiaries later, he winds up in one of these modern clinks with the pastel pink bars and more psychiatrists than prisoners. And they spend five years trying to undo the damage that was done by that reformatory. That's an oversimplification, he shouted. How else are we going to talk if we don't simplify, you fat-headed, fat-filled do-gooder? I didn't come here to be insulted, I know. All right, now listen. You take that same kid, only instead of the law getting him, I get him. And nobody knows about his crime but me and the grocer and his parents. He gets the scare of his life when he sees how easily he was caught. And he gets the word on what would have happened if the cops had found him instead of me. And the grocer gets his money back, and the kid never pulls that kind of stunt again. He shook his head rapidly, saying, And you accuse me of idealism when you expect... Expect hell. That's what happened. That is exactly what happened with a kid who broke into Joey Casal's grocery store. The hell with your theories. I'm telling you what works, and I'm trying to tell you what the goddamn system is in this world and how I fit into that system. And if I don't fit into that system, I'm through. If Satan himself... He started, but I cut him off. You're goddamn 100% right, I snapped. If Satan himself or Mayor Winston and all the lesser devils had all the offices in City Hall, they would be the ones running my world. And if I expected to live in that world, I would have to make my peace with them. Make a deal with them, you mean. Say it any way you want, I said. He took a deep breath, then suddenly turned away from me and walked over to the window. He stood looking down at Winston for a long minute, and then he glanced back at me and said, you ought to leave Winston for a while, Mr. Smith. You ought to leave right away. 
and he was a different man. The voice, the manner of speaking, the words, the expression on his face, all were totally different. In that one split second he had gone from Archer de Neal, reformer and idealist and prim Puritan, to Archer de Neal, practical and realistic human being. The switch was too fast for me. I was still mad at that other Daniil, and so my voice was unnecessarily loud and harsh when I said, Why should I? There are things here you know nothing about, he said. You live too close to the surface. You shouldn't judge men on the assumption that they, too, live close to the surface. I sympathize with you, and, in a way, I agree with you. And I am giving you friendly advice when I suggest that you leave town for a while, and that you do not leave a forwarding address behind you. Speak plainly, I said. He shook his head, smiling a bit. I have. I can't speak more plainly. The telephone rang then, interrupting my question before it got fairly started. Scowling, Daniil picked up the receiver, listened for a moment, and said, Five minutes. He listened again and said, All right, and what about Miss London? Isn't she back in her room yet? Yes, you do that. He hung up, looked back at me, and said, Not tonight, Mr. Smith. Perhaps tomorrow. If you're foolish enough to still be in town, and dependent upon circumstances, of course, perhaps tomorrow we can make some arrangement. In the meantime, good night, Mr. Smith. I studied him, and I could make no sense out of him. Good night, I said, and left the apartment. I rode down in the elevator, thinking glum thoughts, and in the lobby I noticed somebody I knew, a little old man in a black suit and a chauffeur's cap. His name was Tommy O'Connell, and he was sitting over in a corner, apparently waiting for somebody, and his presence answered a number of questions. But I'll take direct evidence in preference to circumstantial evidence every time, as I'd mentioned to Harkham this afternoon. So I walked over and said, Hi, Tommy. Oh, hi there, Tim, he said. He grinned up at me, so he hadn't been told who he should or shouldn't be talking to. Daniil will be down in a couple of minutes, I said. He nodded. I know, he said. The guy on the desk just called him. So that was that. I said so long to Jordan Reed's chauffeur and walked out of the hotel. End of chapter 28「Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 29 The living room was crowded when I got back to Kathy's place. Aside from Kathy and Bill Casal and Hal Gans, there were three new arrivals, the presence of all of whom surprised the hell out of me. One of them was Ron, whom I hadn't expected to see out on bail before tomorrow morning. The second was Art, my former bodyguard courtesy of Jack Veitcha, whom I hadn't expected to see ever again. And the third was Councilman Myron Stoneman, one of the seven people to whom I had made my ultimatum the day before. Everybody wanted to talk at once, including me, and so everybody jabbered and nobody listened until finally Ron shouted us all down and said, One at a time, goddammit, one at a time. Let's get straightened out here. Myron, you first. Myron nodded at Ron. His heavy, not very bright-looking face was dark with controlled anger. Thanks, Ron, he said. You've been training yourself for the legislature, I see. Speak your piece, Myron, I said. Myron turned his scowl to me. I've always thought it a good idea, he said, to know what my friends and partners are up to. So I've cultivated a few secretaries and clerks, a Bush League spy system, to let me know what's doing in the world. It's paid off. About an hour ago, I got a call from Jordan Reed's secretary. Reed is selling us out. He's wrangled a deal with the CCG. Him and Harkham and Watkins. A deal? The way I hear it, he said sourly, Jordan has high hopes of being governor. So that's what Jordan wanted, a substitute for his son. The whole state. What about the rest of you? I asked. He's throwing us to the wolves. Dan Wanamaker and Claude Bryce and Les Manners and Ron over there and you, Tim. A nice all-star lineup for the scandal. So they could be bought, said Ron softly. Myron glanced at him and grinned without humor. They sure as hell could, he said. Dan Wanamaker and Claude Bryce have already left town. Les Manners is reading his law books. I want to know what you people are planning on doing. 
Hal Gans, his faith in human institutions practically indestructible, said, Are you sure they got a deal with the CCG? Maybe they're just hoping for one. Maybe the CCG doesn't know anything about it. No, the CCG knows plenty about it, I told him. That's why Mazzetti was pulled out. He was a legitimately honest reformer. The new man they sent in, Daniil, is a politician's politician. You talk to him, Tim, said Ron. What did he have to say? The brush off, I told him. He didn't want me or anything I could offer him. When I left, Jordan Reed's chauffeur was waiting to take Daniil for his meeting with Reed. At the plant, said Myron. That's where she said they were getting together. Well, there are six of us here, said Ron. Not counting Kathy, of course. Maybe it would be a good idea if we all went over to the plant and had a talk with these people. Now, said Art. We all turned and looked at him. I'd practically forgotten he was there. I still didn't know whether Jack Veitcha had sent him back or he had come on his own hook sticking to the agreement we had made. Why wouldn't it be a good idea? Ron asked him. Art looked at me. I don't know any of these people, Mr. Smith, he said, except Bill Casal there. It's all right, I told him. We're all in the same leaky boat together. I looked around at the others. This is Art, I said. He works for Jack Veitcha. Wait, he corrected me. I reeled off the names of the other people present and then said, Now, why wouldn't it be a good idea for us to go down to Reed and King? Because Reed and Jack Mitcha have combined, he said, and everybody started talking again. This time, I was the one who shouted them all down and said to Art, What do you mean they've combined? Just what I said. They've teamed up. I guess Reed was afraid you people would make trouble, so he and the rest of his crowd uh, holed up at his plant. And Jack is going there, too, with a small army. That's the deal. Reed promises to protect Jack from the CCG, and Jack supplies the army to protect Reed from you people. I guess, said Myron Stoneman slowly, Dan and Bryce had the right idea after all. Leaving town might be the smartest thing to do under the circumstances. No, goddammit! I was stuck, and I was getting mad, and there was no place for me to get rid of the anger. I'm not running away, I said. I'm going to beat these bastards. How? said Myron. I glared at him and shook my head. I didn't know how. An army, said Ron softly, as though he couldn't believe it. For God's sake, he's got an army. And then we were silent. We were all involved in this, and we were all discovering that we'd wound up on the short end of a very dirty stick, all except Bill Casal, still sitting silently in a corner and waiting to find out who had killed his grandfather. Bill Casal? By God, I had an army, too. I jumped to my feet. Bill, I said. He looked startled at being addressed. One of the seven people, I told him, killed your grandfather. One of them is Myron Stoneman, right over there. Two have just left town. One is at home, trying to find a loophole in his law books, and the other three are out at the Reed and King plant. Now, it's got to be one of those seven. Which one? He asked me. Not me, Tim, said Myron. Shut up. I said over my shoulder, back to Bill. I said, what will you do when I tell you which one it was? I'll call my father, he said, and tell him. And then what? Then the family, he said stolidly, will go get the guy. What if he's one of the three at the plant, I insisted. Hold up there with Jack Veitcha's crowd for the north side to protect him. We'll still get him, said Bill calmly. Are you sure? He nodded. I know my family, he said. What if I just tossed out a name? I asked him. What if I said right now that Jordan Reed killed your grandfather? Did he? That isn't the point. What if I said he did? You'd have to prove it to my father, he said. The family isn't here just to do your work for you. I'd done my work too well. I could remember the good old days when the Casal family was ready to lynch Ron Laskow on no more say-so than the radio. Now, when I needed them, they wanted proof. If I prove my case, Bill, I said, and it turns out he's one of the men in the plant, then your family will go get him, right? He nodded. Suddenly, Art chuckled. Mr. Smith, he said, you're a wonder. I don't understand, said Hal. He was looking in bewilderment from face to face. It's easy, Art told him. Mr. Smith here just recruited his own army. Well, it might not be one of the three, Tim, said Ron. Hal Gann said, Tim, you can't mean it. That isn't the way to do things, Tim. You gotta let the law... 
If we let the law, Myra interrupted him, we'll all be on the inside looking out. Oh, not you, I suppose. You'll look like one of those clean-nosed types, but I'll be jailed, and so will Ron Laskow over there, and so will Tim. But, for God's sake, cried Hal, a, a pitched battle? What other way is there, Hal? I demanded. I, I can't believe the CCG. He started. Hal, wake up, snapped Ron. You heard what Tim said when he came back. The guy from the CCG is going off to meet Jordan Reed. Jack Bycho wouldn't have mobilized his crowd, said Art, unless he had a pretty strong guarantee from Reed. Hal shook his head. Uh, there has to be some other way, he said. If we could send a plea to the governor, Ron said. No, Hal, I'm sorry, but the answer is no. Let me tell you some politics. The governor of this state lives in the capital, Albany. He belongs to one political party, and the city of Albany is controlled by the other political party. The way I understand it, the CCG has a close unofficial connection with the governor's party, and is building up a reputation on small towns in order to get the local machine in Albany. The governor would very naturally like to see the capital city of the state run by his own party. This has gone beyond politics, said Hal desperately. For you, maybe, said Myron. Not for the politicians. A thing like this, said Ron, doesn't leave politics behind until it reaches court, and sometimes not even then. The decision is going to be made in this town long before anybody gets to court. The one who goes to court, indicted by a grand jury, will be the ones who have already lost. I don't see what you're trying to convince him for, said Art. Don't you have other things to do? Uh, I think I should leave said Hal, getting to his feet. I nodded. Maybe you're right. We waited silently until he left, and then Art said, When does this army of yours go into action, Mr. Smith? Well, that's the tough part, I said. I have to find out who's been doing the killing. And if it isn't one of the people in the plant, I don't have an army after all. It wasn't me, said Myron. That's all I can tell you. It wasn't me, and I didn't even know about this CCG business until the morning after that gunman tried to kill you. Let's do this the old classical way, said Ron. The three parts of any murder, motive, method, and opportunity. All right, I said. Try it and see where it gets you. Opportunity to begin with. They all had lots of opportunity. The first attempt was made at one in the morning. Myron, where were you? He grinned. <laughs> Home and bad. That's exactly what the other six will say, too. And the second try was when the guy shot at me from City Hall. And all seven were in City Hall at the time. My grandfather was killed at 11.30 at night, said Bill. Another nighttime job, I said. Again, everybody's home in bed. And the fourth one was the bomb in my car. It could have been put in there at any time over a 12-hour period by anybody in the world. So that takes care of opportunity. What's next? Method, said Ron. I shrugged. A hired gunman, a grenade, a gun, and a homemade bomb. What can you say about method? Art said, your killer is pretty shy. You can say that much. He doesn't like to show his face. Staying out of sight when something illegal is going on, said Ron blandly, is instinctive with politicians. After the first attempt, I said, I gave Harkham a profile of the guy we were after on the basis of method. He hired a professional killer out of New York. That meant he was pretty well to do. He shot the professional with a hunting rifle, which probably meant he had a hunting license, and goes out after deer every fall. And the gunman wasn't worried about being arrested, so the guy who hired him was probably influential locally. There's your profile, based on method. A rich and influential local citizen who has a hunting rifle. And who's been to New York recently, added Kathy. Well, that profile fits all seven of us, said Myron, including me, unhappily. We're all... Influential locally, God knows, or at least we were up to today. And we all have hunting licenses and hunting rifles, and we've all been to New York sometime within the last month and a half or two months. And, he offered us a crooked grin, we've all made out rather well financially. Method on the second try, I said. A gun. Anybody can have a gun. On the third try, said Ron, a hand grenade. I shouldn't think hand grenades would be that easy to come across. He offered us a sour grin. <laughs> Except from the National Guard, he said. All seven of us, said Myron, have almost complete run of City Hall, including the jail and police headquarters down in the basement. 
I understand they have a variety of weapons in the armory down there, including some souvenir guns and hand grenades and samurai swords taken from our returning veterans after Second World War. On the fourth try, I said, a homemade bomb. I don't know which one of them has the knowledge to construct a bomb like that. Anybody else? Jordan Reed has his own chemical plant, said Art. That's a thought, but does it mean he knows how to make a bomb? And does he, asked Ron, have the same free access to City Hall that the others have? I suppose he could get any key he wanted, yes, said Myron. So they all had opportunity, and any one of them might have used these methods, though Jordan Reed might be more likely for the bomb in the car. Well, that leaves motive, said Ron. The coming of the CCG, I said. Once again, they all fit. Wait a second, Tim, said Kathy. You're not saying that right. I'm not saying what right. You're saying, she said earnestly, that wanting somebody dead is a motive for murder. But that isn't right. You have to know why the person wanted that other person dead. That's the motive. You have to ask yourself why the coming of the CCG made somebody want to kill you. I've been going round and round with that question for two days, I told her. Ron said, what about this girl that got killed out at Reed's place? Where does she fit into all this? I don't think she does, I said. What girl? asked Myron. A girl named Sherry something or other, I told him. Stacked blonde, you might have seen her hanging around with Harkham lately. She's dead? Seems she's an old girlfriend of Marvin Reed's, I said. I guess Harkham was around just to give her transportation here, and the first chance she got she let out to see Marvin and wound up with a hunting knife in her, out in the woods by Reed's house. Kathy said, And it looks as though Marvin did it, is that right? Looks that way, I said thoughtfully. Funny thing, I said. Jordan washed his hands of the whole thing as soon as he found out Marvin had been playing around. And Marv said, I'll do anything for you. To his father, he said that. So what? said Ron. This is goofy, I said. Myron said, you mean Jordan killed the girl and Marvin will take the blame? Something goofier than that, I told him. Marvin will do anything for his old man, including killing me, do you think? If a bunch of reformers are coming into town and he knows his father is worried. Not Marvin, said Kathy. He might kill that girl because he was all upset, but he wouldn't coldly plan to kill anybody and just keep trying time after time. Let's forget that thing said Ron, and go back to the main issue. We're talking about motive. And not getting anywhere, I said. Why would this guy want to kill you? Ron asked rhetorically. Maybe, said Kathy thoughtfully. That's the wrong question. I looked at her. What other question is there? I'm not sure, she said. I don't know if this would help or not, but why not ask yourself what would happen if you were dead? What would happen if I were dead? She nodded. That's the same question. No, it isn't, said Ron suddenly. Kathy may have something there. He looked urgently at me. Tim, he said, what would change? What would be different if you were dead? Nothing right now, I told him. Two, three days ago when this all started... I don't know, the CCG would probably have had to go somewhere else to get its evidence, that's all. I can't think of anything else. Your files would still be around, said Ron, where the CCG could probably have got hold of them anyway, so that wouldn't make any difference. There must have been some definite result the killer had in mind, said Kathy, something that would happen if and when you were to die. If we could only, started Ron, but then it hit me. Wait a minute, I shouted and jumped from my chair. I pointed at Ron, who blinked at me in total confusion. You said it! I shouted at him. You said it! He stared at me open-mouthed. I said what? Wait, I said. Just wait. I ran to the phone, dialed, waited. And when Charlie came on, I said, Is Sherry London there? She is dead, he said. Thanks, I said and hung up grinning. Kathy said, What is it, Tim? Do you know who it is? Bill, suddenly alert, said, You got it, Tim? Call your father, I told him. Call him right now. I've got it cold. End of chapter 29
Chapter 30 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 30 I was back in the Casal brothers' warehouse, but this time I was face to face with Mike Casal and the family. It was a large bare room, a few crates lined up along one wall, and it was full of Casals. The whole male population of the family was there, plus some of the truckers who worked for Mike, plus Ron and Art and Kathy and Myron Stoneman and me. I started talking the minute I walked in, giving them everything that had happened in the last couple of days so they'd have enough facts to understand my proof. They listened impatiently, and I got through the history as quickly as I could. Then I said, I saw it when Kathy there asked me what would change if I were dead. It suddenly occurred to me that my filing cabinet, or its contents anyway, would immediately be impounded as evidence in the case. The killer had already been approached by the CCG and asked if he could supply convictable evidence on the rest of the crowd, on the basis that the CCG would leave him alone and pay him off. You mean the CCG asked this guy to kill you? demanded Ron. No, they left it to him to get the stuff any way he could. This was the only way. Who is this guy? demanded Mike Casal. Hold on, I told him. I'll get to it. I don't want to toss a name at you. I want to give you the facts until you can see it for yourselves. Start with the first murder. A hired gunman from New York. Now, who among the people out at that plant now would have the contacts and the knowledge necessary to go to New York and find a professional killer? Could any of you do it? Raid could, said Sal Casal. Don't rush it, I told him. Remember what happened after the gunman missed. The police were called, arrived in a prowl car, and a few minutes later, the gunman was shot down. Now, put yourself in the killer's place. You hire someone to do your killing for you, right? Do you then hang around where he's going to do the job? The hell you do. You stay far, far away from the scene of the crime. How come he was there? Ron asked me. How come he knew to get there? I countered. All right, move on to attempts number three and four. Both times he used explosives. Reed can get his hands on explosives, said Sal Casal. He runs a chemical plant. He doesn't make hand grenades in that plant, I told him. That most likely came out of the police armory at City Hall. Now who could most easily get a hand grenade from the police army? Any of us, said Myron Stoneman. Who would most likely, I went on, have some time in his career picked up the knowledge for putting together a homemade bomb? Who could most readily have cut me out of the burglar alarm system? Who would be most likely to have a police radio in his home and hear the call to the prowl car that came to the diner and know his hired gunman had missed? And who would gain possession of my files if I were killed and they were impounded as evidence? Harkham, said Sal Casal softly. Some of you may have noticed the blonde Harkham's been squiring around the last few days, I said. Her name is Sherry London. She was murdered this afternoon, and the new CCG man was trying to get in touch with her tonight, not knowing she was dead. She was the contact between Harkham and the CCG. When it was clear that Harkham couldn't deliver, the CCG switched over and made a deal with Reed. Sherry was on her way to him, and Harkham saw himself on the outside again. He tried to stop her from going to Reed, not knowing that Reed had already made the deal in Albany. She wouldn't stop. He had to kill her, hoping he could pin it on Marvin Reed, hoping it would give him time to get back with the CCG. Okay, Tim, said Mike Casal. You've convinced me. We'll take care of him. You and your friends go on now. What? What is this? He shook his head. I know what you were counting on, Tim, he said. You expected us to go tearing in and clean everything up for you. But we're not going to get ourselves killed off for you or anybody else. It's strictly a personal matter. Harkham and us. You won't get to Harkham, I warned him, without fighting the others. From what you say, he said, they make a habit of selling each other out. If we make the request strong enough, I think they'll give them to us. Art spoke up suddenly. I doubt it, he said. Mike turned and studied Art. Is that so? Jack Veitch's thrown in with the rest of them, Art said. And you don't force Jack to do anything. If you try to take Harkham, Jack will fight you. Mike looked from Art to me as though wondering what Art's credentials were, and I said, uh, Art knows what he's talking about, and if you don't show force, the others won't have any reason to give him up. 
Salcasal came forward to stand beside his brother and glared at us. If we have to fight, he said, we'll fight. But it'll be our fight. You reach for your own chestnuts, Smith. If that was the way they wanted it. All right, I said. It's your show. Tim, said Kathy. Come on, I said to her. Come on. Let Mike and the others decide what to do. Kathy wanted to stay and argue, and so did Ron. But Myron and Art and I herded them out and down the stairs and out of the building where I shut off their jabbering and said, Ron, you take Kathy home. Myron, you get lost too. I can help, Tim, said Ron. You're right, you can. Here's my car keys. Take Kathy home. I turned away, saying to Art, You still with me? All the way, Mr. Smith, he said. He was grinning again. Now Kathy started jabbering, but I ignored her and headed down the street toward the Reed and King plant three blocks away. At the corner, Art said, Where now, Mr. Smith? A phone. This way. We turned off Front Street to the right, walked a block, and found a bar. At the phone booth and back, I said, I'm going to dial Reed's private number at the plant. You do the talking. Ask for Jack. Tell him who and where you are, but don't mention I'm with you. Tell him you worked your way into my confidence, and now I'm leading the Casal family. Tell him the family knows Harkham killed its patriarch and is about to march on the plant. Art's grin broadened, and he said, Making sure there's a war, huh? Right. He studied me for a second, grinning, then shook his head in admiration. Give me a dime, he said. End of chapter 30. Chapter 31 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 31. The Reed and King plant, like Casal Brothers, took up a square block of Front Street. Unlike Casal Brothers, three blocks away, the square was neat and pretty as an architect's model. The building was shaped like a plus sign, a long main building with wings jutting out on each side. It was five stories tall, sandblasted and near white, and surrounded by blacktop parking lots and neatly mowed bits of lawn. The whole block was encircled by hedges four feet tall, except for the broad sidewalk leading up to the main entrance, and the entrances to the two parking lots. Across the street from the plant was a row of old tenement buildings, most of them empty, a couple used as warehouses one down at the corner containing a luncheonette, closed at this time of night. Art and I were waiting in the ground-floor living room of one of the empty ones, sitting by the broken glass front windows and watching the street and the plant building across the way. We'd been waiting fifteen minutes when Art whispered, Here they come. I shifted position and looked out the panelless window. Three people were coming down this side of the street, Mike Casal and his brother Sal and his son Bill. They were the only ones in sight. I knew what Mike had in mind. They planned to go in there themselves, just the three of them, to give Jack Beitcha no fears about their trying to force entry. Then they would try to convince Reed and the others that it would be safer and easier to turn Harkham over, without causing any trouble or any war. A fine idea, but it wouldn't work. I had made sure of that. The three of them passed the building I was hiding in and walked on. They were going to die. I held the splintery window sill and watched, and waited. They walked on a ways until they were directly opposite the main entrance of the sprawling, unlit plant building. Then Mike led the way across the street, Bill to his right and Sal to his left. All at once my head was halfway out the window and I was shouting, DON'T! I couldn't do it. I couldn't gun them down that way. I got the one word out, and Art was dragging me back inside, one hand clamped over my mouth, and the shots cracked from a ground floor window in the plant. They had just reached the opposite curb. Mike toppled backwards off the curb, Sal doubled over and collapsed face first on the sidewalk, and Bill spun around like a toy pulled by a string. He took two steps along the sidewalk, faltering, and another shot rang out. He fell like a tree. There was absolute silence on the street. Beside me I could hear a slight rustling as Art shifted position. Then his whisper sounded, harsh in my ear. What the hell were you trying to do? I couldn't have explained it to him. Not in a million years. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker Chapter 32 Silence for ten minutes. 
The plant building was dark-windowed and still, waiting. The three bodies lay unmoving on the pavement, half-lit by a streetlight farther to the left. There was no traffic and no pedestrians. Front Street was exclusively commercial property, and now, almost one in the morning, the only people around were the combatants. Silence for ten minutes, and then all hell broke loose. A sudden roar of truck engines came from the right, and a Casal Brothers truck rumbled into sight, followed by another truck, and another, and another. The first jumped the curb in front of the main entrance to the plant, crossed the sidewalk, plowed through the hedge, and jolted to a stop a yard from the main entrance. The second and third followed the first, passed it, and halted on the lawn between hedge and building. The fourth tore through the hedge on the other side of the main entrance and stopped just behind the first, as two more trucks raced down from the other direction and into the parking lot to the left of the building. Men poured from the backs of the trucks, carrying rifles and pistols. Red and white light flashes spurted at the windows as those inside fired on the attackers, and then the Casals had shot the lock off the front door and burst through and into the building. There had been maybe sixty men in the trucks that had stopped at the front of the building. Five of these were now lying on the walk near the front door. The rest had surged inside, and I could hear gunfire and shouts from within the building. To the left, a second skirmish had started in the parking lot, out of sight. The shooting went on and on, spreading out as the Casals moved deeper into the building. A man, Casal or Vicha, I couldn't tell, suddenly burst out the gaping front doorway and ran for the street. He got halfway before fire flared in the doorway behind him, and he hurtled to his face, skidding on the pavement. Glass shattered in a second-story window and a body dropped out, twisting in the air, crashing onto the hood of one of the trucks. Then a group of men raced out of the empty building to the left of the one we were in. They dashed directly across the street and through the main entrance of the plant. Art grunted and said, That's Jack. That's his way. Let them into the building, then hit them from two sides. He got to his feet suddenly and said, If we're going to move at all, Mr. Smith, now's the time. I kept watching. Mike and Sal and Bill still lay on the sidewalk out where I could get a good view of them. One of the trucks had driven over Bill's legs. That seemed like a hell of a thing to do. Now, Mr. Smith, said Art coldly. I looked up at him. He didn't think as much of me anymore, and he wasn't bothering to hide it. It must be nice, I thought, to not give a damn. But of course he didn't know any of the Casals. All right, I said, now. I stood beside him, looking out the window, trying to think. We'll want to go through the parking lot, I said. Reed's offices are on that side, on the fifth floor. All right, he said. We'll go out the back way, I said, trying to think. I closed my eyes. We'll go down through the backyards to the corner and cross there. All right, he said again. He started away, turned to look at me. Come on, Mr. Smith, he said. I opened my eyes. They were still lying there. All right, I said. End of chapter 32. Chapter 33 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 33. There were maybe a dozen cars scattered around the parking lot, plus the two Casal Brothers trucks. On this side, light shone from windows on the fourth and fifth floors, and I caught occasional glimpses of people moving around inside. There was no one in the parking lot at all. Art and I were crouched behind the hedge next to the parking lot entrance. I whispered, We'll make a run for that first car, the Dodge. We'll work our way from car to car till we reach the building. Lead on, Mr. Smith, he said scornfully. I'm right in front of you. I moved out from the hedge and started running, crouched over, weaving as I ran, a stocky idiot who had lost the reins. Halfway to the Dodge, the ground suddenly shook beneath my feet and I lost my balance and fell headlong, my pistol flying out of my hand. I landed hard on the right shoulder and rolled up against a rear wheel of the Dodge. I sat up fast and lunged for it as the ground trembled again, and this time I heard the sound of the explosion. Art cried out and I looked up. The Reed and King building seemed to be framed by a yellow-white halo and the roar of the explosion tumbled down around me. The halo suddenly expanded, flashing red-white. The ground shivered again and the thunder of the third explosion drowned out the noises from inside the building. There were two more explosions and then sudden silence, and at last I managed to scrabble across the blacktop and get the revolver back into my hand. The silence lasted only a few seconds, and then ragged shooting began again. 
I struggled to my feet and was about to move forward when someone clutched at my arm, crying, Tim, Tim, please, for the love of God. I spun around, pulling away from the hand, and stared into the frightened eyes of Marvin Reed. My father's in there, he screamed at me. What's happening? For the love of God, what's happening? What the hell do you care? I shouted. He doesn't give a damn about you. Art was beside me, still unexcited, still giving me his harsh and bitter grin. Come on, Mr. Smith, he said. We've got to help him, Marvin was crying. Tim, help me. We got to get him out of there. Go away, Marvin. Go away. He was pawing at me, and I pushed him away, shouting, I'm not going to help your father, you damn fool. I'm on the other side. He stared at me, white-faced, and suddenly his hand was reaching into his coat pocket and coming out again with a gun, and he was screaming something at me. I gaped at him. The gun came up, and the sound of the shot was the loudest thing in the world. Marvin slammed backwards onto the blacktop, and Art said, You're going to have to do better than that, Mr. Smith. My mind just wouldn't work. I stared down at Marvin, and I said, What? What? He didn't shoot you, Mr. Smith, said Art dryly. I shot him. A sudden, louder burst of gunfire tore me back to reality. I looked around and saw that a door in the side of the building was open, and four men were racing across the parking lot. Other men appeared in the doorway, firing after them, and one of the four staggered and dropped. The other three reached a car, scrambled into it, and the car leaped forward, turning sharply to come about and head for the street. The men in the doorway kept firing, and the car tore out of the parking lot straight across the street and crashed into the plate glass window of the luncheonette. I ducked behind the Dodge and watched. The second group ran across the parking lot. I recognized them as Casals, and then I saw Daniil clamber drunkenly from the wrecked car and stand weaving, his hands out in supplication as he mouthed words that were drowned by all the rest of the noise in the world. Suddenly he fell to his knees, his hands still out and his mouth still moving, and toppled forward onto his face. The Casals reached the car and dragged out the other two. One was a Vaitcha and the other was our district attorney, George Watkins, his round face white with shock. Art nudged my arm. What now, Mr. Smith? Through that door, I said. That leads up to Reed's suite. Okay, he said. Come on. He ran for the doorway, and I chugged after him, expecting any second a bullet from one of the windows to tear into me. But we reached the doorway, dashed into the building, and found ourselves in a stairwell by Jordan Reed's private elevator. A distorted figure lay sprawled face down on the stairs. We moved up the stairs, quickly and cautiously. A fire door was closed on the second floor, and we could hear shooting from the other side of it. We kept on going and ran into a barricade on the third floor. Office furniture was piled across the doorway from the stairwell to the hall. Four Vichas were behind this barrier, firing spasmodically at someone we couldn't see. Art and I stood on the landing below, just out of sight of the defenders. Art whispered, Are you gonna use that gun, Mr. Smith? Reed surprised me. I said, don't worry, I'll use it. You'd better. I won't be able to get all four of them myself. I'll shoot, goddammit. All right, I'll take the two on the left, he hesitated. Now! And jumped out on the landing. It only took a second. We leaped out where we could see them and each fired twice and they slumped down over their barricade. It wasn't real. I pointed and made a noise and they slumped, not breathing. It wasn't real. And then it was. We ran up the stairs, past the barricade, and up the next two flights to the fifth floor. The door here led to Reed's outer office. Art reached for the doorknob, and I pulled him away. Don't be stupid. He looked at me, studying my face, and suddenly grinned. You're back, huh? I'm back. And I was. From the minute the three Casals had been gunned down, I'd been out of it. Fuzzy and bewildered and afraid. Shooting the two at the barricade had torn me back. I'd had to make a decision there, fast. If I wanted Harkham, I had to get by the men at the barricade. If I wanted him badly enough, all of this was justified and necessary. I wanted him that badly. Get against the wall beside the door, I told Art. I'll be on the other side. I'll push the door open, but we won't go in until I say so. Right you are, Mr. Smith. We took our positions, and I reached out, turned the knob, and shoved the door open wide. Shots rattled from inside, and four holes appeared in the wall opposite the doorway. The shots stopped and I spun around into the doorway, firing before I saw what I was firing at. Pete and Gar Vaitcha, both still in their police uniforms, crumpled behind the secretary's desk. Art rushed past me around the desk and fired once. 
I moved across to the next door, glancing at the men on the floor. Garvacha's mouth and eyes were open, and he looked as though he were grinning. I remember passing him day after day up at the corner of State and DeWitt. I remember him saying, Good day for drinking. The next door led to Reed's office. We worked the same routine again, and this time Art moved first. There were no shots when I pushed the door open. Art hesitated and then jumped into the doorway, snapping off one shot as he moved. He stopped, looked into the room, and cautiously crossed the threshold. Then he looked back at me, grinning in embarrassment. <laughs> Nobody here. We crossed Reed's office to the next door, Art said. Where does this one lead? Conference room. We'll change tactics this time. You keep to the side again, but this time you open the door. Where are you going to be? Right here, I said. I lay down on my stomach, facing the door of the thirty-two held up in front of me, my elbows on the floor. Art got into position. Say when? Now. He pushed the door open, and a Vaitcha fired two shots over my head. The conference table was tipped on its side, and he was crouched behind it, only his head and one arm showing. He got the two shots off, both high, and then I fired, and he fell backward out of sight. Art dashed into the room, vaulted over the table, and another defender appeared, scrabbling to his feet unarmed, backing away, his face a study in pure terror. He managed to say, Don't! before Art shot him. I got up from the floor and ran into the room. There were two more doors here, one leading to the dining room and one to Reed's living quarters. They would be in the living quarters. I turned that way just as the door opened and Jack Vitcha started in. He stopped short, gaping at me, and then he saw Art. You dirty louse! he cried, and his hand came up with a pistol in it. The three of us all fired at the same time. Jack crashed backward out of the doorway, landing heavily. He half rolled over, trying to sit up, and then fell back and lay still. Come on, I shouted, and ran forward. At the doorway, I paused and looked back. Art was sprawled on the floor behind the conference table, lying on his left side. Vicha's shot had caught him in the face. I turned away, stepped over Vicha's body, and suddenly realized I only had two rounds left in my gun. I went back and scooped up Vicha's, a forty-five automatic, and checked the clip. The shot he had fired at Art had been his first. There were seven bullets left. I pushed the clip back into the butt and went on. I moved cautiously into the next room beyond, which was Jordan Reed's smaller, private dining room. It was empty, and there was only one room beyond it, Reed's bedroom. I started across the dining room, and then I noticed a door open to my right. It led to another flight of stairs. I turned that way, and a slight noise behind me made me spin around to see Reed in the doorway of the room I'd just come from, a pistol in his hand. We just stared at each other for a second, and then I said, Hiya, Governor. I saw his face tighten the way Tarker's had at the diner. He fired twice as I threw myself to the side and tried to bring Veitch's forty-five to bear on him. I hit the floor rolling, came to a stop on my back, and pulled the trigger three times before Reed was flung off his feet and slammed to the floor. A forty-five has a lot more power than a thirty-two. I started to get to my feet, but my left arm wouldn't take any weight. It crumpled under me, and I looked at it and saw the hole in my shirt where a bullet had gone through. The arm didn't hurt at all, but it just wouldn't work right. I crawled to the wall, climbed up it until I was standing, and turned again to the stairway. Far below me, I could hear the sound of someone clattering down the stairs. I followed three steps at a time. This was Reed's personal stairway, with exits only on the fifth floor and at street level, where it led to the spot where he kept his Lincoln Continental. I was at the third floor landing when another explosion rocked the building, and I almost lost my balance and fell down the next flight. I crashed into the wall instead, driving my weight against the left arm. That hurt it. I bit my lip to make the fuzziness go away and kept moving. Ahead of me there was gunfire. A lot of it. I came to the last landing before street level and saw three men in police uniform firing out at somebody in the parking lot. There was a fourth guy there, too, behind the cops. He turned to look up at me as I reached the landing. Harkham. I fired at him but missed, and he shoved one of the cops ahead of him through the doorway. I saw the cop fall and Harkham leap over him and out of sight. The other two cops ran after him. I went down the last flight like a mountain goat, twisted my ankle at the bottom, and brought up hard against the wall. I looked through the doorway and saw the Lincoln moving jerkily across the parking lot, four Casals running after it and shooting. I ran out, limping, and saw a Casal brother's truck off to my left. I hobbled to it and climbed into the cab. As I had hoped, the driver had been in too much of a hurry to take keys with him. I started the engine, swung the truck around, and took off after the Lincoln. The windshield spattered in front of my face and I crouched down behind the wheel, just barely looking out over the hood. 
The Lincoln reached the street, wobbling badly from two flat tires, and swung right, but the driver couldn't control it anymore, and it veered back to the left again. I pulled up on the right, swung the wheel hard, and drove the Lincoln up over the curb and into the stoop of one of the empty buildings. I clambered down from the cab, my bad ankle not wanting to support my weight, and fell against the truck of the Lincoln. They were piling out, and I fired through the back window, hitting one of the cops. The other one was apparently already dead, and Harkham was out and running, fat but agile, diving through a shattered basement window and out of sight. To have followed him that way, I would have had to silhouette myself in the window, the streetlight behind me. Instead, I climbed up on the Lincoln, the forty-five tucked under my belt because I only had my right arm to work with, and crawled through a first-floor window into the living room. I got the forty-five into my hand again and limped cautiously across the room, the floor scattered with brittle lengths of ancient wallpaper. I moved slowly, trying not to make any noise, and finally got out to the hall. I found the door leading to the basement and waited, leaning against the wall. A couple of minutes went by. Outside, I could hear the muffled sounds of the battle still raging. In the distance, coming steadily closer, the wail of fire engines. Looking up, I saw through the doorless front entrance an angry red glow. The plant was burning. My mind kept wanting to think about tomorrow, but it couldn't. Harkham was in this building, and my arm was beginning to throb. There wasn't any such thing as a tomorrow, anyway. Another explosion bellowed out from the plant, drowning out the roar of the fighting. I waited, thinking, Get it over with, Harkham. Come up here and get it over with. You and the others. You've ripped everything to pieces, and I've helped, and now let's finish it. The basement door slowly opened, and a darker shadow came out to the shadowy hallway, silhouetting itself against the red glow in the entrance. Round, plain Harkham, who had tried four times to kill me and not shown himself to me once. He crept slowly down the hallway toward the front of the building, and I could make out the gun he was holding tensely in his right hand. I stood away from the wall, the forty-five trained on his round figure, and I said, Face me, Harkham. For once in your life, face me. But he wouldn't. The second I started to talk, he ran. I cried, Harkham! But he kept running, through the doorless entrance and outside, above the crushed stoop and the wrecked Lincoln. He was framed there for a second, against a double glow of yellow streetlight and angry red from the flaming plant, and then a ragged volley of shots tore and jerked him like a marionette, till the strings were suddenly clipped and he plummeted off the broken stoop and out of sight. I hadn't killed him. I had come to kill him. I had emptied two guns. I had caused all this waste. And it had taken someone else to kill Harkham. He wouldn't face me. I limped forward and was almost to the door when the big explosion came, shaking the building like a gambler shaking a dice cup, and I staggered, putting my weight on the bad leg. I fell, losing the gun, and lay on my face, waiting for the trembling of the building to lessen and stop. It did, finally, and I struggled back to my feet. Outside, the fire engines were arriving, their sirens screaming down through the octaves to a dying-away guttural groan. There were no more shots, only the shouting of the survivors and the incredibly loud crackling of flames. I moved along the wall to the front entrance and peered out. The plant was wrapped in flames fantastically tall and loud and bright, and in their glare I could see the firemen hurrying about their business, and the police cars arriving, bearing the neutral cops, the Hal Gans kind of cop. It was difficult to climb down the pile of lumber that had once been the front stoop. I had to crawl down backwards, and when I reached the bottom I heard Kathy calling my name, over and over again, from far, far away. I turned around, and Kathy was way down the street running toward me. But between us was a Casal, standing directly in front of me, cradling a shotgun. He looked at me, icy cold. You set this up, you son of a bitch, he said. You set this up. I whispered. I had to. He raised the shotgun. The sound I heard was Kathy screaming. End of chapter 33 and end of Killing Time by Donald Westlake.